All right, all right. I love the buzz in the room, but if you would return to your seats, we're going to get started this morning. If you don't know me, I'm Pastor Brian Mandel. I'm the executive pastor here at the Bridge Church, and it's my honor this morning uh, to step into Pastor Jimmy's place and bring you the word today. And I want to take just a moment. We're actually live streaming our 11 o'clock service today. We don't normally do that, but we had a blip last time. And uh, Pastor Jimmy and Annette are actually watching us right now. They're joining us online. So can everybody just give them a round of applause? You can turn around to the camera and wave at them. They can see you probably right there right now. We love you, Pastor Jimmy and Annette. They're on their uh, sabbatical refresh for the month of July, and we're just uh, blessing them and praying that God fills them up so they can come back and leak it all out. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, we're so grateful for them. And Pastor Jimmy and Annette, thank you for all that you do. I, I'm assuming you can see me right now. Um, also, I uh, want to take a moment. And I want to acknowledge uh, our Catalyst student ministry. Hey, guys, how y'all doing? Y'all give it up for our students over here. Um, these guys just got, got, got back from camp yesterday, and it was pretty good, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah look at that. Come on, come on. You know, um, it, was, it was a battle. Uh, I, got the, I was getting the play-by-play because -play my wife was there with them, and we had a bunch of adult leaders, amazing leaders there with them. And thank you for all the leaders that went and were with our, our students at camp. But, man, the first four days, it was like God was chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, just little bits, little bits, little bits. But then something happened on that fifth day of camp, didn't it? And it's like finally, like it, my wife described it as like the dam broke. And all of a sudden, the flood of God's spirit came in. And on that fifth night of camp, we saw over 20 students born again, 20 of our students, and dozens more, I'm just telling you, experiencing the tangible presence of God in ways that are, are probably hard to even describe, giving them breakthrough and freedom. We, we were seeing addictions come off of people and, and, and deliverance and freedom from past trauma and different things that had happened in people's lives. And I mean, they were weeping and they were crying and they were ministering to one another. And that's what it takes. Sometimes you've got to get away for five days and get out of the normal routine of things in order for God. God to get a hold of you on that level. And I just want you guys to know today how proud we are of you. We are so proud of you. And on behalf of Bridge Church, you need to know that you're not just the Catalyst students off over there. You are part of this family. And we love you guys. And you are, we don't look at you as kids. Y'all are men and women of God right now. Right now. And we love you guys so much. And thank you, church, for all of you who are wearing the wristbands and praying for them. Prayer works. And if it weren't for your prayers, I don't know what would have happened. But because we prayed, God broke through. Amen. And we thought it'd be really cool if they joined us today for this word because we feel like what we're going to talk about today will strengthen you in what God has done over this last week. So I pray that this ministers to you and to you guys. So get ready to take some notes today. Let's pray real quick that God speaks to us this morning. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, in Jesus' name, we submit ourselves to your word and we're asking not for information today, but for revelation. God, that you would speak through these words to our hearts and change our lives, God. That we would know Jesus greater than we've ever known him before when we walk out of this place and that we would be brought to life in our spirit and our soul and in our bodies that we might serve you with passion, God. I'm asking that in Jesus' name and everybody who believes said, amen. amen. Y'all believe God's gonna do that today? All right. Well, I'm so excited to launch into a new series with you guys today called Draw Your Sword. And we just celebrated one of the coolest holidays that we have here in our nation uh, called America. And that was Independence Day, the 4th of July. Did y'all have a good Independence Day, a good Freedom Day? How many of y'all are grateful for the unique and distinctive freedoms that we experience in this in crazy experiment called America? It is unlike any other place on planet Earth for all of history. There has never been a nation like ours, while not perfect and with plenty of mistakes, that has been founded on principles that were yet so right and so central. And guess what those principles were? They were on God and his word. Amen. And it, it struck me uh, this last week. God reminded me that freedom, real freedom, does not come from man. Real freedom can only be granted by God himself. 
There is no real freedom. There, there can be the illusion of freedom apart from God, but real freedom only comes from God. The scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And how many of you know, where is the spirit of the Lord in the church today? He's in us. The Bible says that when Jesus rose from the dead, the Holy Spirit was sent to indwell and live on the inside of every single disciple of Jesus who would follow him for all of time. And that we are the bearers of the Spirit of God. And the Word tells us that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Which means if there is to be freedom in America, perpetually ongoing from here, it's going to be up to us, His people. Amen? If we don't bear His Spirit, and if we don't bring freedom with us wherever we go, the real freedom, the Spirit of freedom, there will not be freedom in the land of America for much longer. But I believe that God has called His church to rise up. Do you all believe that? to stand up, to stand out, to suit up, to show up, all the things we've been talking about. And I believe that the stakes have never been higher in our nation for the church to either rise up in the spirit of the Lord or to shrink back and just receive whatever the culture decides to bring. It's up to us. We have to decide. And I am convinced that what will determine our response and what will empower our deliverance, both as individuals and as a nation, is all going to come back to the Bible itself. Will we put the word of God back in the place of honor that it's supposed to have in our lives, in our families, in our nation, in all of our spheres? Amen. Are you with me so far? The Bible, the word of God. The revelation of truth. The love story written by God to each of us individually, delivered down through thousands of years, through millennia to us, miraculously that we have it today. This is not a human book. This is not just a collection of nice ideas. We understand this to be the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God himself delivered by the Holy Spirit to his people throughout the generations. And by the end of today, I hope to have convinced you that in an investment in this book, Time spent in this book with your faith will yield greater results than anything else you could spend your time doing in all of your life. Anything else. We live in a time where the Bible, Bibles litter our homes. Our, our homes are full of them, but it's not in our hearts. And at our time of greatest attack and decision point as a nation, it's time for the church to not just have a Bible in their hand, but to have this word in their mouth and in their hearts and in our minds and bringing the spirit of the Lord and the spirit of freedom with us wherever we go. Can you say amen to that this morning? It's time to bring out the book, church. Anybody want to bring out the book besides me? Hmm. So I want to ask a question that we're going to kick off in this series today. Does the Bible actually matter? You say yes, but does it really? Does it actually matter to you? Does this book matter so much to you that you'd give up silver and gold and everything you have just to have this? That's the legacy of the saints. And we're going to see that today. Look at this quote from President Ronald Reagan. He said this, of the many influences that have shaped the United States of America into a distinctive nation, what makes us distinct, and people, None may be said to be more fundamental and enduring than the Bible. The Bible and its teaching helped form the basis for the founding fathers' abiding belief in the inalienable rights of the individual. Do you understand that there are no human rights except that which God gives us? Man can't give rights to other men. Only God can give us rights. And the, the founders understood that through these scriptures that God has determined value and worth on you and me and so that there are things that he wants to protect for each of us. God said that. We didn't come up with that. 
And Reagan goes on to say, rights which they found implicit in the Bible's teachings of the inherent worth and dignity of each individual. History is replete with examples of civilizations that marginalized and devalued people. And God alone in his word says that, no, you are worthy, you are significant, you matter, each and every one of you. Only God says that. And only men with the spirit of God have that echoing in their hearts. President Abraham Lincoln said this. He said, the Bible is the best gift God has ever given to men. All the good the Savior gave to the world was communicated through this book. But for it, we could not know right from wrong. And we live in a day where we've imagined we can figure out what's right and what's wrong without this book, even in the church. And what we do is we get ourselves in all kinds of messes and all kinds of destructive things thinking we figured it out. But God himself says the only way you're really going to know right from wrong is when this divides your heart. It's in here. It's not out there. It's not in here. It starts here. Are you all with me this morning? It's awful quiet in this Methodist church this morning. I'm just kidding. (laughs) You know, God's people in the historic church has always held the scriptures to be inspired by God himself. That's been the belief of the church all through the ages and the belief of God's people long before the church even existed in the Old Testament. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says it like this. It says all scripture, somebody say all scripture, scripture. is inspired by God. You don't have to keep repeating after me. That's cool though. (laughs) Look at this, and it is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and it teaches us to do what is right. Look at this, God uses it. Somebody say God uses it. It It says God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So if you put that verse in the reverse, What that tells me is that if this word is not in your heart, in your mind, deeply, then you are inherently unprepared, useless, unequipped, and wrong. Ooh, that's intense. Hey, I didn't say it. God said it. Now, I don't know about you, but when I stand before God, I would prefer that the descriptors of me and my life were not unprepared, useless, worthless, and wrong. And the only way I'm not going to be those things, Scripture tells me, is to get in this book. Because it teaches me. It it prepares and equips me for every good work. It shows me what is true and what is right. It is inspired by God himself. It is truth. And without it, I'm wrong. Are you all with me so far? There was a guy named Chuck Colson. This guy was a powerful attorney, and he was a political advisor. He worked in the uh, Richard Nixon administration. He even got embroiled in all that Watergate scandal way back then. And then after that happened, he had a radical conversion experience, and he became a believer, and he left all of that behind, this guy. And after that, he founded something called Prison Fellowship, which is a powerful prison ministry that exists to this day and has ministered to tens of thousands of uh, people in prison and felons and brought them to Jesus Christ. And he said this at one point while he, after he had founded Prison Fellowship. He said, the Bible, banned, burned, beloved, more widely read and more frequently attacked than any other book in history generations of intellectuals have attempted, attempted to discredit it. Dictators of every age have outlawed it and executed those who read it. Y'all learned at camp just this week about like Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar and all that and, and how they got persecuted for praying, right? Persecuted for following God, right? That's not unique to that time. All throughout history, this book has been under attack. And if it could have been destroyed, it would have happened a long time ago. But God has preserved his word and faithfully delivered it to every generation. Are you all with me this morning? The quote goes on to say this. Yet soldiers carry it into battle, believing it more powerful than their weapons. I saw that firsthand in the military when I was in the Iraq war with the Air Force. And a group of us guys clung to this 
far more than we did our rifles. And I saw God do amazing, miraculous things while I was out in the desert. It's the legacy of God's word. Look at this. Fragments of it smuggled into solitary prison cells have transformed ruthless killers into gentle saints. In Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about putting on the armor of God. And there's a bunch of pieces of it. And all the pieces of the armor of God are defensive and meant to protect you except for one piece. Mentioned in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, it says this. In verse 17, it says, And take the sword of the Spirit. Everybody say, the sword. What is the sword of the Spirit? It says, which is the Word of God. Our only offense, our only ability that we will ever have as God's people to make any progress in our own hearts and lives and to make any difference in the world that we live in is going to be through the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We have a church today in America who's wearing a lot of the other pieces of armor and is largely playing defense all the time as we're slowly pushed back by the enemy and Satan and principalities and powers because we forgot our sword. And we don't have truth abiding in us that it would come out of our mouth and slice through the lies. It's time to draw our sword. Are y'all with me this morning? Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says it like this. For the word of God is living. Somebody say it's living. It's in a dead book. This is a living book. It's living and it's powerful. And sharper than any two-edged Sword. There it is again, the sword. I wondered why the sword has two edges. And I have a theory. Can't prove it, but I got a theory. I think one edge of this sword is meant to cut you. And then the other edge of the sword is meant to cut through everything you'll ever face. It's not a one edged sword, it's a two edged sword. And you must start by letting it cut you to the core slice you down the middle of everything you ever thought was true, every, everything you ever thought was good, everything you ever thought was right, everything you ever thought was okay and acceptable, and let it slice you down the middle. Because this verse goes on to say this. It says, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. It can separate the godly part of the inside of you and the rest. It cuts right through it. Look at this. And of joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. We're not just meant to read this book. We're meant for this book to read us. Y'all with me this morning? That's good preaching. Amen. <laughs> Jesus made an interesting statement in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. He says, do, he says this. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. What? That blows hippie, groovy Jesus out of the water. Hey, man, peace, dude. I just, I'm here for you, and I love you. And, you know, we have this image of Jesus sometimes, like he's just coming to, to pat you on the head and be like, hey, it, it's okay, you're okay, you're fine. You're fine, just, just stay like you are. I love you just like you are. Nothing needs to change. I'm sure you're right about everything. <laughs> Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace on the earth. What does he say? He says, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Now he wasn't going around slaughtering people. You know what he was doing? He was speaking truth. He was speaking God's words out of his mouth because he was the word. And he said, I came to bring a sword that would cut people down the middle and reveal their true thoughts, their true intents, their true motives, what's really going on, what's actually right and wrong in their lives, and to bring healing and wholeness and real freedom. He said, I came to bring a sword. And he said, what did he say to his church? He said, come follow me. Folks, we're meant to be bearing a sword. Swords drawn, not to attack people, but to heal them. Yeah. Not to be religious and belligerent and arrogant, but to let it slice us to the core so that we can become like Jesus. Are y'all with me this morning? Yes. The sword has to slay you first. That's why it says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, it says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. How did you die? Because you let this thing slay you. 
The word of God killed my old life. It sliced through the lies I used to believe. It sliced through the strongholds I used to be in bondage to. It sliced through my warped conception of what was right and wrong and okay and not. And it demolished and it destroyed and it killed all of that. And now the life I live is in Christ Jesus and the spirit of the Lord is on me and I bring freedom wherever I go. And once the sword slays you, then the sword becomes yours and you can draw your sword and you are prepared for everything you will ever face. Everything. But I fear something. I fear we live in a time where many in God's body have traded the sword for the equivalent of a pool noodle. Ever seen a pool noodle? And they're great for floating around on a lazy day. And you know what I think? I think a lot of us have pool noodle faith. And it's just enough to keep us floating on the lazy river as long as our walk with God resembles a luxury vacation. And yet many have limp, weak, wimpy, intangible, ineffective, uncompelling convenience-oriented sunshine faith based on the reasonings of men rather than the eternal word of God. And if cross-examined or squeezed, many of us would perform worse than the presidential debate we just watched a few days ago. That's all I'm going to say about that. But seriously, folks, So many of us are easily confused, easily deceived, easily misled, easily blown and tossed by the winds because we don't have the eternal life-giving word of God abiding on the inside of us, coming out of us, showing us wisdom, showing us what's right and wrong and bringing freedom. It's a problem. That's why it says in John chapter one, it says something interesting. It says, in the beginning was the word. Notice it's a capital W there because the word isn't a thing. The word's actually a person. It's God himself. Did you know that God and his word are inseparable? If you know this word, you know God. If you know God, you'll know this word. One reveals the other. It says this about Jesus. It says, it says, he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. Look at this. And the word became flesh. That's Jesus and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. You can't know Jesus apart from this word, and this word won't make a lick of sense to you apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. You want this book to come alive? Give your life to Jesus, and it will. This is, the, the Bible says of itself, this is foolishness to the wicked and those who don't want to know God, but for those of us who are redeemed and saved, it is the power of God working in and through us. God reveals it, he illuminates it, he makes it make sense, amen? This is why it says in Acts chapter 20, verse 32, Paul's last statement to a church before he's about to leave them, they're never gonna see Paul again because he's gonna go and be arrested and ultimately taken to Rome and, and, and killed for his faith and they're never gonna see him again. And the very last thing Paul says to this group who's never gonna see him again is this. He says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. Paul was drawing the distinction that you can't know God without also knowing the word of his grace. That term, the word of his grace, the word grace there actually means God's power. It's the word of his power. In the book of Hebrews, it literally says that God upholds all things by the word of his power. That the universe and the stars and the sun and everything that we see and experience, the rotation of the planet, the oxygen in your lung, all of it exists and holds together. The atoms and the cells in your body literally hold together and keep from flying apart by the word of his power. When God created in the beginning, it says he spoke and it was. His word is power. Are y'all with me this morning? And yet there's many who try to have a relationship with Jesus and they don't read this book. And the result of that is you have people who are serving a counterfeit Jesus because they don't know him. 
They have a Jesus that they worship that they've created in their own imagination and they've made him the way they want him to be and they worship that and they don't realize they're worshiping nothing. I commend you to God and the word of his grace. You need to have a relationship with him and you need his word to show you who he really is. Not who people say he is, not who I say he is, not who what a podcast or a book says he is, not with your, what your goofball friend said about him, what he says about himself. Amen. Are you with me? Yes, thank you. We've got one. So I'm going to bring you some things that I hope will just blow your mind and build your confidence and faith in this book and make you want to dive into it. So let me start with some bad news. There was a study done by the Center for Bible Engagement. They, they surveyed and studied over 40,000 Christians in America crossing all denominational lines from ages 8 to age 80. So pretty broad, full spectrum here. This is, what they, this is one of the things they found out. Out of that sampling, 52% of Christians in America never read this book. Never. I promise you they don't know the real Jesus. 8% read it a few times per year. So now we're at 60% total who either read it never or almost never. That's of Christians, not just random people. Listen, listen to this. 6% read this book once per month. 8% read it once per week. 13% several times per week. And 14% every day. By my count there, that's about 27% of Christians in America that read this with any kind of regularity at all. So they went deeper into this study and they found some things that are super encouraging but also super scary for those of us who are not in this book. They found that people that read this book one time per week, it has no real tangible, noticeable impact on their life. And then they moved it up to two times a week. And they, they found that people that read this book two times a week, it's about the same thing, not much of a difference, almost hardly any real impact practically in their life. By the time they got to people who read this book three times per week, there was a little blip on the radar. Like, boop, like all of a sudden, like somebody's about to die and like, ooh, there, there's a heartbeat. Okay, we're not totally dead. But, but just, just a little bit. So like the line's like this and now it's like, it's like that. But at four times per week, all of a sudden, the study showed results that spiked off the chart like this. And I want to show you, if you read your, your Bible four times a week or more, this is what they showed through this study of 40,000 Christians starts to happen. Feeling lonely drops 30%. Anger issues drop 32%. Bitterness in relationships Marriages with kids, etc., drops 40%. Alcoholism drops 57%. People who read their Bible four times a week or more are 61% less likely to view pornography. Got quiet there. Feeling spiritually stagnant drops 60%. Think about that for a second. Have you ever felt dead and stagnant in your faith like God's just not real and you're not connecting with him and you don't know where you're going or what he's doing in your life? And it literally says that drops by 60% if you just get in this thing four times a week. I don't even know what happens if you get in more than that. And we're just talking baseline here. Look at this. Divorce drops 62%. This sounds powerful, doesn't it? What else do you know makes divorce evaporate at a rate of 62%? I don't know of anything. Sex outside of marriage drops 68%. Gambling is down 75%. And here gets to some really cool stuff. People sharing their faith increases 200%. Discipling others jumps 230%. Why? Because the word comes alive and it bursts freedom in you and you can't help but share it. Why do we not share our faith? Because we don't have any to share. Because the word isn't in our hearts. But if we'll just get in this book even four times a week, 
an explosion of his power and grace happens. Are y'all with me this morning? This is why Charles Spurgeon said this. A Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to somebody whose life is not. So my question, are you falling apart or is your Bible falling apart? It's going to be one or the other. I just vote we don't be insane. What do you say? It seems insane to me that we go, eh, I don't really need this. I'm going to go be destroyed. I think it might be worth a little bit of time if we really believe what we say we believe. Did you know, well, let me give you an illustration. When I was uh, young, my, my dad brought me in to help him fix something. Our VCR had broken at our house. Anybody remember VCRs, VHS tapes? Uh, good times there. Y'all probably have no idea what I'm talking about. But anyway, so our VCR broke, and my dad's like, all right, we're going to fix this thing. Get in here or whatever. And we just started going for it, man. And we're taking that thing apart and fiddling with it. We're like, oh, I think this might be the problem. And blah, blah, blah. And we, we get it. We're like, okay, I think we got it fixed. Let's put this thing back together. We put it back together. And then after we put it together, we're like, huh, what are all these extra screws? <laughs> eh, they must not be important. <laughs> Throw them away, right? That VCR never worked again. It went from being broken to completely irreparable. Not only did we not fix it, we made it worse. Why? Because like quintessential guys, we're like, eh, we don't need any instructions. We got this. Do we really think that a Sunday morning service is going to be enough to get you through the instruction you need for your life? Let me put it this way. What if I told you that it was really dangerous out there. And there's mines everywhere, everywhere. And you will blow up if you step on one. But good news, here is a map to the location of all of the mines. Here you go. I'm going to give it to you for free. In fact, here, take five or six copies of it. Have it in different translations if you want. With pictures. And you just go, eh, I'm kind of busy. Maybe I'll look at that some other time or whatever. And you walk outside and you go, boom, dynamite. That's ridiculous. Who would do that? What, who would be that irresponsible? Who would be that idiotic, insane? And yet, are there minds in our lives? Are there pitfalls? Are there things against us that we desperately need God's wisdom to navigate around? And has he not given us in fact, a map that apparently we don't read. Maybe we are insane. Did you know that the longest chapter in the whole Bible is Psalm 119? It's 176 verses long. It's longer than some other entire books of the Bible. And it was written, scholars say, by a, uh, a Babylonian captive, a Jewish person who is literally captured in, by the Babylonian army when they took over Israel and brought captive back into the land of Babylon. Not unlike what you learned about in camp. And out of that captivity, he wrote Psalm 119. And as you know, in the longest chapter of the whole Bible, every single one of those 176 verses talks about how much he depends on the word of God for everything in his life. And that without it, he wouldn't make it every single verse in the longest chapter of the Bible. Do you think God's trying to tell us something? It's out of Psalm 119 that we get one of our favorite verses. Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What sense would it make if we're walking around in the dark to say, ah, I don't need the lamp today? I don't know what you're going to step on. Go read Psalm 119. It will blow you away. In fact, let me share, I'll share a couple, couple tidbits from Psalm 119. Verse 92 says this. It says, if your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. Verse 93 says, I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. Verse 97 says, oh, how I love your law, the scriptures. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies. How are you going to defeat the enemies in your life? Really, only by this. It goes on to say, 
I have more understanding than all of my teachers. What's going to give you the wisdom that you need to do everything in your life? Only this. He says, I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. Verse 103, he says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding, and therefore I hate every false way. And he goes on and on and on. So the question I want to ask today with the remainder of the time we have is can we really trust this book? Like, is this really God's word and can we know it? Can we know that this is from God himself and not just some random ideas of dudes? Let me share a few things with you that might encourage you. This Bible that you hold in your hands, hopefully, is made up of 66 books written over 1,500 years by over 40 different authors who lived on three different continents and it was written in three different languages, Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew. And all of the people who contributed to this book were from vastly different backgrounds, like no similarity. You had fishermen, you had shepherds, you had military men, you had kings, you had a royal cupbearer, you had a medical doctor, you had a tax collector who was a mafia guy, you had a tent maker, and on and on and on it goes. The most random conglomeration of people across 1,500 years in different languages and continents you could ever imagine. Some of them wrote what they wrote from prison, while others wrote what they wrote from palaces. And many of them, most of the people who wrote, never met each other or even knew that the other ones existed or who had ever read what the other ones wrote. And yet, when put together, it formed a perfectly harmonized book with a singular message of God's plan of redemption for mankind from Genesis to Revelation. How in the world did that happen? It's because it's from God and not us. Are y'all with me this morning? It gets better. By the way, there's no other religious text for any other religion that has anything like that to say. They're all written by a singular person at one point in time. Nothing compares. This book is unparalleled. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament is made up of 39 books written over 1,100 years. Did you know that the last book of the Old Testament was finished 400 years before Jesus Christ was born? And yet, all throughout the Old Testament, there are over 300 prophecies and predictions, precise, detailed prophecies and predictions about things that the coming Messiah, Jesus, would do. And did you know that Jesus perfectly fulfilled all 300 prophecies, the last of which was written 400 years before he was born? How does that happen in a book? Only if God wrote it. Because he sits outside of time and he sees the end from the beginning and he knows what's going to happen and he's trying to give us what we need. Talking about those prophecies for a second. There was a man named Dr. Peter Stoner. He was a scientist. He was the chairman of mathematics and science at Pasadena, Pasadena City College and Westmont College. And he was an expert in probability. Probability simply explained as like if you threw 10 golf balls in a bucket and one of them was painted red and you covered your eyes, the chances that you would pick out the one red golf ball is one in 10. That's how probability works. Dr. Stoner was an expert in probability and he hired 600 students from 12 different classes to conduct the most thorough study ever to evaluate how, what is the chances that one man could fulfill the prophecies predicted about the Messiah, Jesus. And they spent months on this. The National American Scientific Council reviewed their work when it was done and said not only was it accurate, but it was conservative. Here's what they found out. The first round of their study, they just looked at eight of the prophecies. Forget 300. They just took eight of the prophecies about the coming Messiah. We'll put them up on the screen here. It's things like he would be born in Bethlehem. That's from the book of Micah. He would be preceded by a messenger from Isaiah and Malachi. He'd enter Jerusalem on a donkey from Zechariah. He'd be betrayed by a friend. He'd be sold for 30 pieces of silver. The silver would be thrown to the potter. He'd be silent before his accusers. He'd be executed by crucifixion as a thief. They just took those eight and they did a probability study. Say, what is the probability in all of history that one person could fulfill even just those eight things? One person. 
And here's what they came up with. This was his conclusion. It's conservative. The chance that any one man might have lived down to the present time and fulfilled all eight prophecies is one in 10 to the 17th power. That's a one with 17 zeros after it. I don't even know how to say that number. It's like gajillion, bazillion, babillion or something like that. You know what though? I can illustrate that number. What is one in 10 to the 17th illustrated? You would have to take silver dollars about that big and to have 10 to the 17th silver dollars, you would literally have to cover the entire state of Texas two feet deep in them. The entire state. Now mark one of them. Blindfold a guy. Put him on a helicopter, blindfolded. Fly all around the state of Texas. And at any point, this guy could say, okay, let me down. The chances of them letting him down and him going and picking the one marked silver dollar out of the whole state of Texas is the chances that one person could fulfill just eight of the prophecies and yet Jesus fulfilled all 300. It gets better, folks. If you say the Bible isn't reliable, you crazy. You had not done your research. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 44 and 45, the prophet Isaiah predicts that a king by name, a king named Cyrus in the future would come and he would help instigate the rebuilding of the Jewish temple. He wrote this 200 years before a guy named King Cyrus was born, became king, and helped the Jewish people rebuild their temple. He predicted it 200 years in advance. It's documented history. How in the world did he do that? God spoke to him. And God preserved it in his word. Here's another one. 1 Kings chapter 13. A prophet of God speaks and declares that in the future, a king whose name would be Josiah would destroy a false altar built to a pagan god and bring revival to the people of Israel. 300 years later, King Josiah rises up, destroys that pagan altar. It's documented in history and issues revival into the land. How did that happen? I could go on and on and on. Why? Because it's a divinely inspired book authored by God who isn't bound by time and knows the end from the beginning. 2 Peter chapter 1 says this. It says, above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. This is the confidence you can have when you open this book. And it's why you ought to get excited about it. It's why you ought to clear the deck of your week and say, no, I'm getting in here. Joshua chapter one, verse eight says this. It says, God commands Joshua before they're about to go in and really possess the promised land. He says, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Y'all want to hear another couple cool examples? Y'all like this? A couple quick ones. All right. Did you know that the very center chapter of the Bible is Psalm 118, right before Psalm 119? It's the center chapter of the Bible. There's 594 chapters before it. There's 594 chapters after it. If you add up the chapters before and after, it's 1188 chapters. Now take a guess what the exact center verse of the Bible is. It's Psalm 118, verse 8. And guess what that verse says? It says, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Can anybody say that's the understatement of a lifetime right there? How does that happen, folks? Because this book was written by God. Delivered to you. I'll give you one from science. Did you know that for thousands of years, scientists believed that darkness was just the absence of light? I mean, I'm talking all the way up into the 2000s. Scientists believed darkness was the absence of light. Do you know in the book of Job, it's declared thousands of years ago that darkness has substance and it has a home. Did you also know that just 20 years ago, a Canadian astrophysicist named Hugh Ross discovered to the bewilderment of science everywhere that darkness is not the absence of light. It actually has substance. 
just like it said in the book of Job. And now scientists call it dark matter and they figured it out because the substance of that darkness was bending the light of stars around its gravitational pull. Here's what it said in Job verse, chapter 38. It says, where is the way where light dwells? And as for darkness, where is its place? Its place, if you break that down in the Hebrew, is talking about something that exists as a substance that has its own place that you may take it to its territory and that you may know the past to its house. You must know, this is God questioning Job. He's saying, you think you know a lot? Do you know about this? Thousands of years before science could figure it out. How about archeology? span Did you know currently there have been over 23,000 archeological discoveries where the Bible was used as the primary source to find them? 23,000. One of the archeologists who's participated in this is a guy named Nelson Gluick. He's a scholar and archeologist and he's credited with the discovery of more than 1500 ancient sites. He said this, he said, it may be stated categorically that no archeological discovery has ever contradicted a biblical reference, ever. Not only does it not contradict it, you can use this to find things. That's why it says in Proverbs chapter 30, verse five, it says, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to all those who come to him for protection. There are guys like Josh, Josh McDowell. He was a raging atheist and a super smart guy. He was an attorney, hated God, and set out to prove that Christianity was false and the Bible wasn't the real deal. He spent seven years going after that, and instead of proving it, he ended up becoming converted to being a Christian himself, and then he ended up writing a book about it called uh, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. There's another guy named Lee Strobel, you may have heard of him. He was an investigative journalist for the Chicago Tribune, also, also an atheist. One day his wife gets saved. He's so disturbed by it, he's so upset that his wife got saved that he decides, I'm gonna go prove God isn't real and the Bible isn't trustworthy. So he spends years on it, ends up getting saved himself, converted as he's convinced of it. And then he writes a book called The Case for Christ. You see, God hides himself just enough so that only the people who want to find him will. Just enough. He's saying, if you want to know me, I'll reveal myself to you. If you seek, you will find. If you knock, he said, I'll answer the door. But you got to seek him. You got to get in his word. Amen? I'm going to end with this. John chapter 12, verse 48. Jesus talking. He says, he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. You want a cheat sheet for judgment day? Here you go. You, don't know, you want to know what the standard is? Here. This is it for you, for me, for everyone. No escaping it. He's delivered his word to us through the generations. So I want to issue a challenge today. I'm going to call this the four for four, draw your sword challenge. And this isn't like Wendy's four for four where you get a burger and nuggets and stuff. This is a way better deal than that. <laughs> I don't think they have that anymore. Inflation, thank you. The four for four challenge, here it is. <clears throat> I challenge you to read your Bible for four chapters, four times per week for 30 days and see what happens. Why four? Because we saw earlier, man, that something happens when you hit that four times a week mark or more, things just begin to explode in your life. Four chapters, four times a week for 30 days and seek the Lord with your whole heart. And if afterwards you go, this doesn't work, money back guarantee. But that's not what you're gonna find. Anybody in for that with me? Who's up for the challenge? Here's the detail. When you do it, I'm gonna give you a prescription. I want you to read one psalm, one proverb, one chapter of one of the gospels, and then a chapter of anything else you want. Make that your baseline. If you wanna go way beyond that and be a superstar, go for it. But start with this. 
If you're willing to enter into that challenge and give God a chance to show you who he is, I want you to stand to your feet right now. I'm about to pray for you. And before you leave today, grab a connect card, write your name on it, take it out to the connect desk and say, I'm in for the four for four. I want to see how many people are in this with us. And we're going to see what God does over the next 30 days. Close your eyes. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, God, I'm asking that you would make your word come alive to your people. God, that as we return to your book and we bring it out in our lives, God, may it come to life as the living and powerful word that it is. May you speak to our hearts and may the sword of your spirit divide us down the middle and reveal truth to us, God. I pray that you would reveal Jesus to to us greater than we've ever known him before. And Lord, that we would walk in true freedom and in newness of life. God, you promised it. I believe it. And today, God, we step out in faith to act on what you've told us. I'm asking, Lord, that you would confirm your word in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. Can you praise him this morning? Did you get something out of this this morning?